the side of the immigration debate that's being silenced by the government. This is not reported. And don't you dare try telling the truth. And if you believe this, you're a racist. Plus, we're not giving up. From the movie Miracles from Heaven. Can you even hear me? The real Christy Beam speaks out. Really, my first thought was, how hard did you hit your head, baby? <laughs> On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. Folks, if you're confused, you ought to be, because <laughs> most of us are. It's a strange election that's going on right now. But uh, hey, uh, we've had some real good candidates. They've had some interesting fights among themselves. And before long, some Republican is going to start fighting Hillary Clinton. Uh, you'll see how that goes. Uh, so uh, you can get ready for that. Uh, Donald versus Hillary. Uh, Donald Trump scored major victories in the Republican primary on Tuesday. And now it looks like he's on the road to the nomination of the grand old party. Whether they like it or not, Pat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, John Kasich pulled off a win in his home state of Ohio, but it looks like it's too little too late to stop Trump. And Hil Hillary Clinton also took a huge step towards locking down the Democratic nomination. Heather Sells brings us the story. We have to bring our party together. We have to bring it together. Donald Trump may not have brought the party together yet, but math and momentum are now clearly on his side. On Tuesday, he won in North Carolina, Illinois, and Florida, bringing an end to Senator Marco Rubio's campaign. While it is not God's plan that I be president in 2016, or, or maybe ever, the fact that I've even come this far is evidence of how special America truly is. But in Ohio, Trump did fall to its governor, John Kasich. We are going to go all the way to Cleveland and secure the Republican nomination. There's no clear path there for Kasich, however. Six weeks of primary voting have given Trump more than half of the delegates he needs to secure the Republican nomination. But anti-Trump Republicans are pressing in to prevent the frontrunner from winning the GOP nomination. The Associated Press reports that a group of conservatives plan to meet Thursday to discuss a contested convention and the possibility of a third-party candidate. It Even House Speaker go. Paul Ryan is not ruling Biden out the Biden. idea of being drafted by the Fewer party. Choices. On the Democratic Biden. side, Hillary Clinton clearly strengthened her hand on Tuesday, taking Florida, Illinois, Ohio, and North Carolina. We are moving closer to securing the Democratic Party nomination and winning this election in November. She now has at least 1,561 delegates almost twice as many as Bernie Sanders. Sanders is hoping to make up ground in the West where all the campaigns now head. Next week's races include voting for both parties in Utah and Arizona. Heather Sells, CBN News. Well, you wonder uh, what's going to happen to Hillary. Uh, Libya, falling apart. She pointed that as one of the achievements of her regime as uh, Secretary of State, uh, Benghazi, <clears throat> it was misrepresented to the American people as uh, a spontaneous demonstration brought on because of some strange video. Uh, and, and they knew, they knew before they put it out that indeed it was a planned attack by an organized group affiliated with Al Qaeda. And then, of course, is all these emails. And she said, clearly, I didn't have any emails classified on my server. Well, all except uh, 200 or so of them. And uh, it just goes on and on and on, lie after lie. The American people don't trust her. And yet she's the, the, the candidate of the Democratic Party. And you wonder if the FBI is going to move for an indi indictment this summer. So you'll have Trump, and there's no way anybody can mount a third party this late in the game. They, they, they have to register in states. They'd have to get money. They'd have to get candidates. It's not going to happen. And so Donald Trump is it. Now, I have something I'll show you real quick so you'll know what's going on. Trump right now, according to what we have, uh, has 
621 delegates. He needs another 616, and it's going to be tougher and tougher to get them. Ted Cruz pretty much has stalled out. He's got just about 400 delegates. Uh, he needs 841 more, and it just doesn't look like where it's going to come from. Now, Kasich uh, won his state of Ohio, which is very important, uh, but he only has 138 delegates. He needs 1,099 more. Where they're going to come from, we don't know. So uh, that's it. Marco Rubio came out, the fellow dropped out. I, for one, can't understand it. He's a very bright young man. Uh, he has been extraordinarily successful in Florida. And uh, how he uh, just had a meltdown during those debates, I don't know. And how he turned on Trump and began to attack Trump instead of present a vision for America. If he'd presented a coherent vision for America, uh, conservatives and, and the establishment would have coalesced around him. But, of course, they didn't do it because he started acting like an eighth grader. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Well, our CBN News political correspondent David Brody is with us now. And, David, tell me your take on the Trump phenomenon. It's really hard to understand. Yeah, it has all of us uh, scratching our heads to a degree, but there is some reason for it, Pat, and there's, there's actually quite a few reasons, but let's just start with this, and that is simply that, look, Donald Trump is doing well because, in essence, uh, he is changing politics as usual. He's a wrecking ball. In other words, a lot of times, for years and years, we've talked about this idea that uh, we're fed up with politicians, we're fed up with Republicans, we're fed up with Democrats. They, they hew to that orthodoxy uh, of the party line, and that's it, and nothing gets done. Well, along comes Donald Trump, who, let's be honest, Pat, uh, has basically said, you know, I want to be flexible. I might be 70% conservative, 90% conservative, 40% conservative. It depends on the issue. So he's changing politics. And I think it's an, not just an indictment of the Republican Party. I think it's an indictment of politics uh, as, a, as a whole. I mean, look, he's bringing in Democrats. He's bringing in independents. He's bringing in dissatisfied Republicans. Uh, and so I think it really is an indictment overall of the political process. Well, the other candidate that's got a number of delegates close to 400 is Ted Cruz. Does he have any possibility? It's going to be real tough. He's got to win 80 percent, 80 percent of those delegates. And it's uh, going to be very, very hard for him. Look, in the Bible Belt, let's let's go down to the Bible Belt for a moment. In Missouri, there were a few issues as it relates to Ted Cruz. He had four counties that he had to really win down in the Bible Belt, uh, Bible Belt excuse me, southwestern Missouri, uh, Christian County, Green County, Stone County, Taney County. And I got to tell you, Right there in those four counties, Donald Trump won two of those huge Bible Belt counties. Ted Cruz won the other two, but it wasn't enough. And look, if Donald Trump is not just winning, you know, if you look inside the numbers, Donald Trump is winning with uh, evangelicals that have basically gone to church a couple of times a year, you know, a few times a year. But he's also winning with evangelicals, or I shouldn't say winning, excuse me. He's doing actually better than a lot of people thought with people that are going to church more than once a week. Uh, you know, Ted Cruz is winning that group, but not uh, Donald Trump is doing better than expected. Uh, well, John Kasich, uh, of course, won the state of Ohio. And he, that was tough because some of the polls showed Trump ahead of him. Uh, but he says he won't team up with Trump. Uh, do you think he's just talking or you think he really means it? Now, I think he really means it. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, there's been some bad blood between the two, and it's uh, going to get worse here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, John Kasich did well. I mean, it, you know, he won Ohio, but it's like winning a home game for him. He had to do it, uh, and he did. Uh, but what is his uh, encore, if you will? Uh, if you look to the states that are coming up, I mean, you've got uh, New York. That's Donald Trump territory. Delaware, Connecticut, uh, Maryland. You just go down the list. Arizona is coming up next week. And, of course, Donald Trump doing very well in Arizona, the polls show, because of the immigration issue. And so uh, it's going to be very hard for John Kasich. Uh, well, first of all, he can't uh, actually he cannot get the 1237 that he needs uh, to win the nomination. That is mathematically impossible. Uh, and so at that point, this is Donald Trump's uh, race to lose. And, you know, a lot of people think with his rhetoric, he's doing a pretty good job sometimes of trying to lose it. But he's Teflon. He is Teflon, Pat. He really is. Well, you know, if they have a contested, you know, there's people are talking about a third party, but they can't mount a third party this late in the game, can they? 
No, they really can. And you mentioned the ballot issues, and that's that's one issue. But here's the other part of it. Think about this for a moment. Even if Donald Trump doesn't have the 1237 uh, in Cleveland at the convention, are they really going to try and take this nomination away from Donald Trump, a man who has brought in uh, more Democrats, uh, some independents, more voters overall? You know, voting is up 17, or I should say the voting electorate now 17% of voters this time around compared to 2000 or excuse me 1980 in other words the point is is that voting is way way up and it's because of Donald Trump so you're going to take this nomination away from him at the convention even if he's not at that 1237 number I mean as, as Donald Trump said you'd have riots in the streets and talk about hot in Cleveland uh, my goodness, it'll be a wild summer for sure. Well, David, keep watching, buddy. But it looks like the long knives are out. They're going after Trump. And uh, the Trump's going to have, because I say going to have to, he likes to respond. And he's going to go after Hillary big time. Do you, do you, do you know any themes that they're going to develop about Hillary? Well, I think uh, Donald Trump's theme is something when he wakes up every morning, he goes, you know what? That's the theme this morning. I, I think that's really Donald Trump's uh, playbook, and it's kind of worked to a degree. Uh, look, he has even said he has not even begun to go after Hillary and wait till he gets uh, a handle on that. And then, you know, a lot of Republican voters actually like that. They like to see the fight and to take it to Hillary, and that's been part of his uh, method of operation all along, Pat. Well, I can see ads with Bill, uh, I did not have sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky, and morphing mm -hmm. into Hillary. And I mean, and I did not have classified emails on my server I, over and over and over again. I, that's just part of what you can see, and I'm sure Trump's going to play that to the hills. Well, David, thank you so much for being with us. And folks, remember, you can get David's up to the data analysis and interviews on the Brody file on CBNnews.com. Well, what do you think? It's something. Uh, it was exciting last night. It was yeah. almost like election night, you know, just yeah. watching the returns yeah. come in. And uh, did we ever find out what, is it still uh, too close to call in Missouri? I no, think. I think. Did they call it for Trump? Yeah, I think so. I think, they, I think David said they called it for Trump. But right. yeah, it was a very exciting night. But you know, I think that Hillary's going to play hardball. I mean, they, they've they been in politics a long time and everybody talks about the Clinton machine. And you know, I think it's going to be like the fight of all fights. She is so vulnerable. You, you're you looking at Wall Street. I mean, she, she's when you get honoraria in the five and $600,000 per speech range, uh, when you've got a foundation that has taken hundreds of millions of dollars from questionable people when you are secretary of state and it goes down the list i mean i you know i, I just cannot imagine uh, her holding up against a, a withering barrage, but they've well, got to start she's early she's been teflon too yeah i mean it's so it's been but very the game is you damage your opponent early on before the uh, the real mm -hmm. uh, voting starts that was what they did to Bob Dole, and that's what they'll try to do with Trump. They're going after him right now with all they, they've got, and Trump's smart enough, or he should be smart enough, to go after them now. You, 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 so yeah. She's got to be characterized that, as some sort of a crazy right now, and they're going to go after him as some kind of a, you know, they, they will do that. Mm -hmm. And um, the game is do not wait uh, until September to let your opponent paint you into the corner. They did it with Romney, you know. They, yeah. he, he's a, a privileged um, yeah. uh, aristocrat or autocrat mm -hmm. or whatever, and is out of touch. Well, in other news, President Obama is making good on his promise to nominate a Supreme Court justice. And John Jessup has that study or story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. Thanks, Pat. That promise is being filled by the president, even though Senate Republicans have made a promise of their own not to hold hearings on anyone the president nominates. Republicans argue a Supreme Court confirmation fight in an election year would be too politicized. President Obama, meanwhile, says he's fulfilling his constitutional duty to make a nomination and urges senators to do theirs. Republicans say the choice should be up to the next president. Well, Congress has given the State Department until tomorrow to decide whether to label the ISIS slaughter of Christians in the Middle East as genocide. For many Americans, the decision is simple, but the Obama administration has been hesitant. Jennifer Wishon has a story. 
Father Douglas Albazi kept this bloody shirt as a reminder. The Iraqi Christian was wearing it when ISIS terrorists kidnapped him on his way to church. They used to put, for example, piston in my head, hand it to Simon, and just they click. The torture continued for nine days. They used the hammer to broke my teeth, my noise, and my back. Despite beheadings, crucifixions, and driving Christians away from lands they've occupied since Jesus walked on earth, State Department lawyers are reluctant to call this murder and persecution genocide. The government asked several Christian groups to collect evidence. Their 280-page report lays out known crimes against Christians, including a list of those murdered and witness statements. It includes this menu ISIS produced for men interested in buying Christian or Yazidi slaves. 200,000 dinars buys a child aged one to nine. And the rules? It is not allowed for any customer to purchase more than three spoils, except for foreigners like Turks, Syrians, and Gulf Arabs. The word and the only word for what is happening is genocide. There's ample proof, Anderson says, that ISIS wants to rid the world of Christians. In an issue of its magazine, Debeek, ISIS published, We will conquer your Rome, break your crosses, and enslave your women. If we do not reach that time, then our children and grandchildren will reach it, and they will sell your sons and grandsons as slaves at the slave market. The Obama administration says it doesn't want to act hastily in the Middle East, but in this case, the president would be following the European Union, a vast majority of Congress, even the likely Democratic presidential nominee, Hillary Clinton, are all labeling this attempt at Christian extermination genocide. This is about lives, and it's about the impact on real people on a daily basis in a setting that we couldn't possibly imagine. According to the UN, genocide is acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. The only time the U.S. has designated a genocide while it was happening came 12 years ago in Darfur. Then lawyers determined the designation didn't require the U.S. to act. Another reason many Americans wonder why the Obama administration is dragging its feet. I look to my blood every day, and I remember. And this is what's happened even to my people every day. He's fortunate he's alive to remember, unlike so many of his Middle Eastern brothers and sisters in Christ. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, the White House. Thanks, Jennifer. In other news, evangelist Franklin Graham is traveling around the country asking Christians to pray for the nation. He's billed it the Decision America Tour 2016. Graham says neither Democrats nor Republicans can turn the country around. About 10,000 Christians prayed with Graham in Denver on Tuesday. Graham says he believes in getting involved in the political process and supporting Christians who run for office. But he also told CBN News that the most important answer is prayer. We start with prayer. Uh, when we get up on the Capitol steps, I'm going to lead everybody in prayer and uh, have people confess the sins of our nation, confess their own personal sins, the sins of their fathers. This is Nehemiah chapter 1. That's what Nehemiah did. Then God gave Nehemiah favor. We need favor. We need God's favor once again in this country. And the only way this is going to happen is through prayer. You can hear more Franklin Graham's, Graham's interview, including what he says about Christians in politics, and find the schedule for his tour by going to CBNNews.com. And Pat, I can't think of a more timely call for prayer. Absolutely. He's a brave man and a wonderful uh, guy. Uh, we appreciate this uh, initiative because that's the thing we need to do. And what he said is true. Democrat and Republican are not going to save this country. Only the Lord is. And we've got to call on him uh, to bring about revival. Wendy? Amen. Well, coming up, an outspoken and unlikely critic of mass immigration because he's an immigrant himself. There are a lot of cover-ups. They believe that uh, I am confused. But he's not confused. In fact, he says he's one of the only ones speaking the truth. Find out what he has to say when we return. Well, you're watching the 700 Club the day after the election. The Americans get ready to vote on a new president. It's coming up very shortly. Uh, the events have, have just been overtaking us and overwhelming us, I might add. Uh, but uh, while we're selecting a president, we go to Europe. 
Sweden wanted to show the world a glorious multicultural future. Have you heard about that multiculturalism? It sounds so good. But that dream in Sweden got mugged by reality. Immigrants, not multiculturalism, but immigrants have overwhelmed Sweden and now some of the country's biggest opponents to its immigration policy are immigrants. <laughs> Dale Hurd brings us that story. Nima Golamali Poor is an immigrant in Sweden. It might not be such a great time to be an immigrant in Sweden. Sweden's notorious open door policy collapsed after the nation literally ran out of places to house migrants. And a massive crime wave hit asylum centers with reports of boys raped and an asylum worker murdered. Sweden's immigration policy has been failing for so long that a few years ago, this immigrant joined Sweden's anti-immigration party. It says a lot about how badly Sweden's immigration model has run off the rails when an immigrant joins a political party that wants to restrict immigration. Nima says his decision left some Swedes scratching their heads. Uh, they believe that uh, uh, I am confused. And why would he join a party, the Sweden Democrats, that is regularly branded by the left as a racist party? It's not a racist party, it's a conservative party. I just chose a party after the program that suited me. Nima says he's not against immigration per se, just the way Sweden has done it. He came here as a boy from Iran, and today he's a member of the Board of Education in Sweden's third largest city, Malmö, a city which has suffered from immigration. So he's not what you would call a booster for the city of Malmö or for Malmö's troubled schools. No, 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 they're, 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 they're very bad. The city of Malmö is, is a very segregated city. So you have areas where uh, a lot of people are unemployed. He says some schools in bad areas have run out of teachers who speak Swedish. We use uh, Syrian teachers and uh, teachers from uh, Arab countries or, or Afghanistan, and uh, they, don't, they don't speak Swedish. Nima has a master's degree in international migration and ethnic relations, and he calls Sweden's immigration policy a disaster. He also lives it. He told me he has to wear a hoodie through some Malmer neighborhoods so he doesn't get attacked by immigrant gangs. I you know, have a hoodie, I usually take a hoodie, so no one like does anything. So, you, know, you see a group somewhere and if you live in Malmo, you know that you should avoid them or else you will, you will get beat up. It was a trip to the United States that led to his joining a right-wing party. He saw immigration debated openly and honestly in the U.S., something he wasn't seeing in Sweden. There are a lot of cover-ups about immigration here in Sweden. The Swedish government and media have long suppressed bad news about immigration, but it all blew up in a major scandal when the public learned that sexual assaults by migrant males against Swedish girls at a summer music festival last year had been covered up. It seems one group that isn't afraid to tell the truth about immigration in Sweden are some of the immigrants, like Swedish economist Tino Sanandaji, who is a Kurd from Iran. Yeah, immigrants are committing majority of violent crime now. We have reached that point. This is not reported. A lot of people, in fact, the media will go and say this is a myth. And if you believe this, you're a racist. Or Polish immigrant and Malmö resident Barbara Trusch, who warned us that the future of Malmö would be... Hell. Hell. Yes. Sweden has thought of itself as a humanitarian superpower, but Nima Golomalipur says Sweden will not escape the consequences of a reckless immigration policy. He says Swedish society is shattered and ethnic conflict is coming. We have a majority of children in schools who speak another language than Swedish. So in a generation, Mama will, will become a, a city where ethnic Swedes are a minority. We have had riots in Malmö before, but I think we will have it in the future. For his part, Nima has gone back to university to become what Sweden needs more of these days, an elementary school teacher. Dale Hurd, CBN News, in Malmö, Sweden. 
You can't believe how beautiful those countries are. It's so cold Scandinavia. If you go to Sweden or you go to Norway, I, I travel all over Norway, and I've, I've been to Sweden, and uh, there was a guy named Louis Petrus who had a tremendous church uh, in the heart of uh, Stockholm. And uh, I was there and uh, spoke at one of their summer meetings and uh, saw what looked like a real beginning of a spiritual revival. But in those days, Sweden was like a haven for mm -hmm. people who fleeing from the Nazis. And now it, it has just uh, degenerated. It's just been overrun. And, and Dale is showing us some really important things. But Wendy, it's a, it, it breaks your heart to see a beautiful country, and it was a beautiful, prosperous country just being demolished. And you know, and when the immigrants themselves are saying there's a problem with yeah. immigration, there's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's this uh, multiculturalism run uh, amok. It's political correctness run amok, and um, it is it is the leftist philosophy run amok. You know, we have to have certain standards. We have to have certain, uh, you know, integrity to our nations, and we have to have a certain ethnic pride. We can't just say, "Well, everybody's the same," and uh, it, it isn't necessarily the case. And they're finding it's not the case. The, the native Swedes have a culture, and it's being demolished yeah. before our eyes. It's it's Sad. amazing. Okay. Sad. All right. Well, up next, she witnessed a near tragedy that turned into a double miracle. The mother from the new movie Miracles from Heaven shares her side of the story when we come back. Talk about a blessing in disguise. Eight-year-old Annabelle Beam had been suffering from an incurable stomach condition. Then one day, while playing with her sisters, she fell 30 feet into a hollowed-out tree and woke up totally healed. Now her story is being told on the big screen in the new movie, Miracles from Heaven. Take a look. Three the tests confirm that she's very ill. There is currently no cure for Anna's condition. Doctor, please, this is our little girl. I'm scared, Mom. Me too. We're not giving up. Like a small boat on the ocean. We need a solution. We need it now. And we'll get it. How? By not losing our faith. Like how a single Free her from this. Might only have one back. Can you even hear me? I can make an explosion. <laughs> this is my fight. You're telling me that when this baby girl fell 30 feet, she hit her head just right, and it didn't kill her, and it didn't paralyze her. It healed her. Yes. Or that's impossible. This is a little hard to believe. There's a lot of people out there that are just looking for publicity. A lot of people think we're crazy. You either roll with it or you get rolled on. Who told you you'd be fine? With us now is Christy Beam, and she's the author of Miracles from Heaven, the book that this movie is based on, and she's played by Jennifer Garner in the movie. Christy, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Jennifer Garner is playing you in a movie that's going to be on the big screen. How crazy is that? It is so crazy. I am so grateful and so blessed, and she is so amazing. She's, she's an amazing actress and, and a good, good person, I'm told. She yeah. is. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Annabelle, okay. your daughter, who's featured in the movie. She's 13 now. She grew up with two, not one, but two incurable diseases um, that took her in and out of the ER for like several years. What was going on? So Annabelle, when she was four, started having what we call tummy troubles. And when she was five, she fully obstructed abdominally. And then we just lived in and out of um, hospitals, doctors, offices. We got into the guru of pediatric gastroenterology in um, Boston, and we would fly to Boston every four to six weeks for treatments. She lived on the sofa in um, the fetal position with a heating pad on her stomach. Could she eat anything normally? Like mm. eat 
nothing. Very really. little. Some days my prayer was just let Annabelle eat a plate of food throughout the whole day. Let that be wow. um, her success. It, it, she struggled. Well, one day your daughter was home and she was actually feeling pretty good this day. And she was out playing with her two sisters. And you were just happy that she was out playing. And then something awful happened. What happened? Well, um, they were climbing trees, which is their favorite thing to do on our property. And they ended up climbing 30 feet in the air and they were sitting on a branch 30 feet in the air. Um, there was a hole in the other side of the tree where a branch had previously been that had fallen. And um, Annabelle sought refuge in that hole, not thinking that it was anything but a little sh bit shallow, but it actually was the entryway to the bottom of the tree and Annabelle fell head first and she oh fell gosh. 30 feet and was entombed in the base of this hollowed cotton out cottonwood tree on our property. So she was in that hole for five hours mm -hmm. and of course you, they, they had to come and rescue her and get her out. You took her to the hospital. What did the doctor say? Well, they prepared me. They said that they've never had anybody fall 30 feet and not suffer paralysis or broken bones, mm -hmm. but they ran one test after another after another and Annabelle walked away with bruises and scratches and a minor concussion but she was totally <laughs> fine well what did what did Annabelle say happened to her when she was in the in the hollow of that tree well later Annabelle shared with me she just turned to me and she said you know mommy I went to heaven when I was in that tree and did you I, believe her I said really and, and and really my first thought was how hard did you hit your head baby you know like really <laughs> right. but then um, the things she began to share and the things she began to say as a nine-year-old little girl I knew I knew what she said she lived she said that she actually saw some people she did. like a, her, a grandmother yes or? Kevin's grandmother Mimi yeah. and um, I had had two miscarriages and one was an actual viable pregnancy and she said that she saw a little girl who looked just exactly like me and Abby my our oldest daughter and she said that God said Annabelle that's your sister that's incredible now there has been some controversy about these visions or from heaven accounts what do you say to people who may doubt the authenticity of her story no I reply to that with Annabelle's answer, which is I don't say anything to those people because mm -hmm. Annabelle lived it and the proof is in Annabelle's life now. Annabelle is so healthy and so bright and she's living a full, complete life. There is no denying the undeniable. Well, what's incredible about this story and really the other twist is that that fall, that seemingly horrific fall, ended up being a great blessing. Uh, how? because God used this dead, hollowed out, dying cottonwood tree to heal Annabelle from her two incurable digestive disorders. How do you hit your head, die, go to heaven, and come back and you're, and you're cured after four years of this, these incredible, incurable illnesses? It's, it, <laughs> no one can explain it. It just was part of God's plan. I feel like God used that tree to make a way and he healed Annabelle. You know, our prayer was, and so many prayed for Annabelle's healing, and that was that was how he reached her. That was his vessel. Yeah, and of course, in the in the movie trailers, they they do such a great job of having the doctors just say, you know, we can't explain this, and yes. this must be a miracle. So, Absolutely. well, Christy, what what inspired you to write your story and and to make a movie? Well, that's a great question. I. It was laid on my heart by God, and He laid it on my heart. And at first, I said, um, "No, I'm not a writer, but you know, I'm not." But thank you, God. But He wasn't playing. He didn't accept that answer. And um, thank you, God, for I believing did. I could do right. this. I just know. And He was like, mm, "Yeah, you're going to do it." So I started, and I I thought it was more cathartic for me, mm -hmm. and I thought that was all that was going to happen. But He took it, and He did truly amazing God things with everything. What's the movie? making a movie been like? How, how has that been for, your, for you and your family? Um, it's been overwhelming. You know, at times it's been so, so good because the girls I know whenever we were on set at times, they saw their value in Annabelle's story. It wasn't anymore just Annabelle's story. It was about them too. It was our whole family's journey. Um, and then it's been hard to relive some things that we were happy to put in the past. Absolutely. And Annabelle, again, she's 13 now. She's the middle girl. And perfectly healthy. Absolutely. She mm -hmm. can eat anything and it does eat anything and everything and has no problems at all. Hasn't been back in the hospital with any GI issues whatsoever. Has no problems. She's totally healthy on zero medications. All right. Let me ask you, this might be a tough question. Now with the books out, the movies out, you're getting to tell this whole story about 
what God can do. Was it worth it having to go through those years of pain and watching your daughter? Mm -hmm. It's been so worth it because I feel like it's not about me and it's really not about Annabelle. It's about God showing people that He is so faithful and that there is hope despite challenges and struggles and we all have those. And so if this challenge in our life can help bring hope to others, it was worth it. All right, well, you can go further into the story by getting Christy's book that God told her to write. It's called Miracles from Heaven, and it's available nationwide. And of course, don't forget to watch the movie adaptation. Christy Beam, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having you me. You are a blessing, God bless you. Thank you. And we'll be back with more of The 700 Club right after this. Coming up, she was ashamed. I wasn't going out, it was just too embarrassing. And she couldn't do anything about it. I would have to live with it. Hear what gave her back her life. Don't give up. <laughs> Later on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Pastors, churches, and religious organizations in Florida are now protected from potential lawsuits if they refuse to perform same-sex marriages. Governor Rick Scott signed into law a bill known as the Pastor Protection Act. The measure was based on one similar in Texas. A University of Virginia student has been sentenced to 15 years of hard labor in North Korea. The country's highest court sentenced Otto Warmbier for, quote, trying to steal a propaganda banner from a hotel. The 21-year-old student, Tour, says he wanted a banner as a trophy for the mother of a friend. Warmbier was arrested as he was trying to leave North Korea in early January. He was traveling with a New Year's tour group. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Blisters, bubbles, blood, they all oozed over Sander, Sander, Sandra. the serious, Sandra, the serious skin. <laughs> the young mother had a condition that kept her from wanting to go out in public, and creams and meds couldn't solve it. This went on for years. And she was watching an episode of this program hosted by Gordon. It was itching to the point of practically seeing blood. I wasn't going out. Uh, it was just too embarrassing. In 2006, Sandra Nazaro went to the doctor to find relief for a severe rash on her legs. I was explaining the symptoms to the doctor and he just told me, uh, well, it's a form of eczema. He said it, it can just gradually come about. And um, the best he can do was to prescribe some creams for me. The over-the-counter cream the doctor prescribed didn't work. That summer, new symptoms appeared. I noticed blisters on my hands. So went back to the doctor. And he said, yes, this is another form of eczema. It comes out in the heat. Her doctor prescribed more creams. The doctors were pretty negative. Um, they just insisted that that's all they can do and that I would have to live with it. It was too self-conscious. It was too embarrassing. I, I, I wouldn't do anything. I felt like I was in a little bubble hiding. Sandra lived with the itching and embarrassment for years. During this time, she started praying and reading her Bible. Matthew 6.26 says, I take care of the birds in the air, the flowers. How much more will I take care of you? That kept coming around in my head, and I said, well, I know he loves me, so I, I'll just keep praying. That's, that's all I can, I can do. Then one day, she was watching the 700 Club. Then the word of knowledge came on, and Gordon started talking about someone with eczema. Skin condition, and it's um, uh, causing uh, bubbles on the skin. It's like uh, they're filled with fluid, and, and God is healing that. He's taking that all away from you right now. In Jesus' name, Thank you, Lord. be healed. Amen. I kind of 
jumped up and down claiming it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Out of everyone that was watching, you paid attention to me. I knew God was doing something for me as soon as I started feeling the tingling on my legs. I, I knew it was, it was happening. He was healing me. Uh, maybe it wasn't right away, but he was working. Within six months, all of her symptoms of eczema were completely gone. My confidence came back. <laughs> I was not embarrassed anymore. I was very excited. Sandra offers encouragement to anyone waiting on God to heal them. I would say, don't give up. <laughs> Certainly pray um, and talk to Jesus. He's, he's the best person to go to. He's, um, He's your creator. He's, he's a big God. I know God heals today because he healed me. He's a big God. Now you see, Gordon didn't know that woman. He didn't know Sandra. He didn't ever see her in his life. Didn't know what she had. But God knew. And the Lord gave the word into Gordon's mind. And then he spoke. And in the speaking, there was healing. Now, this isn't some kind of hocus pocus. This is the way spiritual power is transmitted. And we're seeing it over and over again. And this is what we see. We've seen thousands and thousands of people heal. And the word of knowledge is just part of it. Now, I want to tell you about some answers to prayer. There's somebody named Ruby who lives in Los Angeles. And Ruby developed an extremely painful toothache. And one day she was watching this program and the host began to pray and she placed her hand on her face. And at that moment, Wendy said, now Wendy, did you know Ruby in Los Angeles? I do not. You do I, not know I Ruby? I don't know Ruby. I don't know Ruby at all. You do not know like Ruby? Her name, you still I haven't met Ruby <laughs> and I don't know Ruby. but. Uh, she said, you said, there's somebody with a very painful tooth, toothache right now, and you've got your hand on your face. The Lord's touching you. Ruby knew the word was for her. She claimed it over the next 24 hours. All of the pain and swelling went away. She never had to go to the dentist to get it fixed. Wow. Now, that's something. You have, you have something? Oh, I do. I do. I was so engrossed in that one. All right. Well, for five years, Melissa of Lake Forest, California, struggled with anxiety issues. Then in April of 2015, she also developed an intense fear. She was afraid to be left alone or to travel anywhere, even to the grocery store by herself. It reached a point where her husband had to quit his job so he could be with her. She continued to work, but her husband had to sit outside her office door. Fear totally ruled her life. Then one day while watching the 700 Club, Melissa heard you give a word of knowledge, Pat, about someone having a cloud of fear over them. And you said that God was setting them free. Melissa claimed that word for herself. She felt a peace settle over her. The fear left. And since that day, she's traveled places by herself without any problems. You know, Jesus the Bible name. says fear hath torment, and fear also paralyzes, and it is a paralyzing thing. Uh, it, it is a weak spirit. In other words, you can get rid of the spirit of fear, uh, but it, it has a par paralyzing effect on people. And in this woman's case, it was, she was being paralyzed. Now, look, we want to pray for you. Now, I don't know if it's financial. I don't know if your family's breaking up, whether your kids are on drugs or, you know, what's going on. There's so many things in our human condition where we suffer. And God Almighty is there to solve those problems. There isn't any condition we have in our life that God can't take care of. So Wendy and I are going to join hands together, and we're going to believe God for you. Amen. Now, Father, I join with my sister in Christ, and I believe God for the answer. A neck muscle has just been healed in Jesus' name. Uh, there's a jaw. Your whole upper jaw is, is somehow infected, and uh, it's a serious problem. And right now, if you just touch your, your face up there where that is, God has healed you in the name of Jesus. Wendy, what do you have? There's some other people that heard that deliverance from fear, and they're saying, I want that. And God is saying, you can have that today. Just command it. We command the spirit of fear to leave you now and never return in Jesus' name. Somebody else with that neck muscle, or maybe you haven't taken it as a muscle in your neck that is really sore. 
Reach up there and touch it. God has just healed it in the name of Jesus. God is healing cancers and tumors of all kinds yes. right now in the name of Jesus. The things the doctor said are incur incurable. God is saying, is anything too hard for me? Just reach out and claim your healing now in Jesus' name. We had that earlier uh, testimony. Somebody else has, has a purient <laughs> discharge in your skin. It's really disgusting. Uh, it, it's just you're embarrassed by it. It's just there. And it, 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 the Lord is taking it away right. It just touch the arm or wherever it is where that stuff is in the name of Jesus, and you'll feel fire. Just walk through it, and you're healed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. So give us a call, will you please? 1 800 759 0700. And tell us what God has done for you. We love to hear, and we love to pray for you. Wendy. We sure do. Well, still ahead. It's a midweek edition of Bring It On. And here's a question from Jess. Does God permit divorce if the other spouse refuses to stop cheating? We'll tackle that question and much more later on today's show. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. Let's go. All right, welcome back to the 700 Club. It's time to bring it on with your email questions. And let's start with Jess, who writes in, does God permit divorce if the spouse refuses to stop cheating? What if you tried everything to make your spouse happy and they refuse to stop cheating, Pat? Uh, well, you know, that's what Jesus said, except for uh, fornication uh, or adultery. I mean, if, if that has broken the marital bond and the... the Brother or sister can certainly, the, the marriage is dissolved. That man has dissolved the marriage by his actions. So he, they have biblical rights if your Absolutely. spouse is. Absolutely. According is, to what Jesus said, that's not the Pauline thing. That's right. Jesus himself. Okay. All right. Kathy says, my 34-year-old son recently died, and I started watching Life After Death stories on YouTube and have seen them on the 700 Club. They've been very comforting to me. I've probably seen 50, and they all have similar experiences. The details are different, but the basic message is the same that God is love. Not all of these people were believers, but they still felt God's unconditional love. If they weren't believers, why did they get to see heaven? Um, look, I, I can't comment on, on fictional stories that you've seen on YouTube or uh, on some story. Uh, I'll tell you what the Bible has to say. Uh, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Um, so, um, after judgment, uh, you're going to account for what you've done in this body. And either you have accepted the Lord and He's forgiven you all your sin, or you will have to account for it. And uh, I, I, from Chauncey Crandall, who's had people die, the ones who uh, the sinners have, have found that they've gone to hell, and it's not they wake up in some paradise. Uh, if, if you're a sinner and you're breaking God's laws and you don't believe in the Lord, uh, uh, hey, uh, I, I wouldn't hold you out a whole lot of hope. I would now. I mean, you can always, there's always redemption now while you're living. But once you're dead, uh, the deal is sealed. Keep that in mind. All right, what else? All right, May writes in, my son gets an extra communion packet of bread and wine from the communion plate on the first Sunday for my daughter-in-law and takes it home to her after church because she prefers not to attend church. Is my son right in taking the communion to her? Uh, you know, I don't think God is all hung up on ceremony. <laughs> uh, Jesus said, they that worship him worship in spirit and in truth. And uh, I, I, the Bible says, don't forsake yourself, the assembling of yourself together. So I think that to stay apart from any kind of church uh, is breaking God's plan. Uh, but taking communion in a fashion like that. Uh, unless you're sick and, you know, and, uh, and unless you're sick and you just can't yeah, that's get right, there. But, that's right. you know, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Well, do, do you think you can take communion? At home, so of people course, think you. Of course, yeah. you can take communion at home. Where two or more gather together in my name, there I am in the midst. Of course, you can. Yeah. 
All right. That's what I think. All right. John says, I have been a Christian for 30 years. Four weeks ago, I began having panic attacks when it's bedtime. I've sent the spirit of fear and timidity out of our home. I sleep two to four hours every three days, and it's really affecting my whole atmosphere. I enjoy Bible reading, and it's even made me too tired to read. Please give me some ideas how to defeat this spirit of fear. Oh, I, I'm not sure that's spiritual. I think you're dealing with something uh, physical, and I think you need to uh, consult uh, a doctor who deals with sleep disorder and to see what you've got. Uh, there's something, uh, I think, uh, chemical that is uh, causing your motor to run over time, and uh, you, you're, you're not resting, and I, I think I, I don't see that as a spirit of fear, but I, I don't know you, so I can't be, um, you know, precise. But you're asking for some thing, and you know, that's what doctors do. They check off, you know, certain potential mm -hmm. uh, symptoms to see if that's the one that works. So I, I really would uh, go to a, a physician who deals with sleep disorder and see if there isn't something that's triggering this. How, how tormenting. You're trying to go to sleep and then you're, you're having panic attacks right when you need rest. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, that's hopefully right. a doctor. But I, I don't think that's a spirit help. of fear. It doesn't sound that way. Well, we leave you with today's power minute from Psalm 29. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. God is so good. Tomorrow, we're going to go inside Tyler Perry's two-hour extravaganza called The Passion. See you then.